broke out later on because of Manchuria um, and Korea. And so the Japanese won that fight as well, which resulted in uh, these territorial shifts. And if you look, you know, just we were talking about today the Sakhalin Islands, you know, this is Sakhalin. Right now, and, right, and even and according to the Treaty of Portsmouth, it was divided here. And this is the territory that's, uh, that's still in effect today. Uh, but the, it's, what's interesting is a lot of Russians actually, actually moved into this area and lived there, but they're actually living under the Japanese rule. We're not talking about like in the very little, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of Russians at least. And so you, you actually technically have Russians living under Japanese rule. Um, you know, that's another case of where you have the country's territories, territorial borders, does not overlap with their with their ethnic borders. And that's just the nature of living on the border. Well, like you'll notice, a lot of uh, not a lot of countries in the world are as homogenous as Korea. And where Korea, uh, what I mean by that is Korea typically only has Koreans in their territory, right? Some Chinese, not actually not a lot of Chinese either, right? Maybe a little bit in North Korea. You need to one. You need to one, right? right? Uh, actually, the Chinese consist of a majority uh, of a very large portion of the Korean population today. A lot of, there's a lot of Chinese immigrants in Korea, and there's a lot of Chinese illegal workers in Korea. Um, but at the same time, they're not really. But at the same time, you know, Korea typically is pretty much Korean. Um, so, Japan and World War One. So we. Uh, so that's kind of a quick flashback. Uh, on the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War. <coughs> Japan, in World War I, continued to try to expand. Right? In World War I, they joined the Entente powers and they demanded German colonial possessions in China. And they told the Germans that get out of China, and their, their justification is because um, they want to keep peace in Asia. And Japan, that, and this is during a time when Japan started seeing themselves as the protectors of China. Um, their slogan was Asia for the Asiatic. So if I'm going to show you this, if you, so if you look at this picture, the Empire of Sea, which means, and here you have Japan standing over this globe, it kind of represents how Japan began to have this idea that Asia for the Asians, and they're painting Asia theirs, basically. Um, just gonna, yeah. So, uh, they joined the Entente in World War One, and uh, Germans ignored the Japanese demands. Japan's like, get out of there. Germans like, no. <laughs> and then Japan declared war on Germany. Once again, indirect cause, indirectly caused by triple intervention. And while there was total war in Europe, Japan uh, issued 21 demands in January uh, 1915. And the 21 demands were actually given to China. Is telling China, hey, these are the 21 demands, these 21 demands that we have for you. And so at that time, the president of China at that time was Ren Shikai. He was actually a Manchurian, uh, he was actually a Manchu general. So he, he came out of the queue and um, we're going to be looking at him a little uh, later, later on when we look at, when we look at China. But uh, Ren Shikai was, uh, was uh, he was a Manchurian general, turned into a president, and he eventually he tried to be an emperor, and some and some stories say that his son tried to convince him that people, his son convinced him that people wanted him to be an emperor again, right? Even after China fought so hard to get a republic, um, and so he's like, oh, okay, so people want me to be emperor, so he tried to be an emperor, uh, and then uh, rebellions happened everywhere because nobody wanted him to be an emperor. <laughs> his son wanted him to be emperor. Why? So he he could take the position. Yeah, so he could take the position in the future. Right? So his son tried to convince him to be an emperor, uh, and he he declared himself to be an emperor. People rebelled, and he became so stressed that he got uh, something called uremia. You guys know what that is? It's one of the interesting interesting little history. Phobia? Uh, no, okay. no, not a phobia. This is one of those interesting little tidbits of history where uremia uh, is basically when you're so when you can't pee, Why? and you die of urine poisoning. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. You can't pee. Really? Yeah. Can you? You have poison. Why can't you pee? You're fucking stuck in your. No. <laughs> I don't think so, Tyler. <laughs> it's just because oh, you're so stressed you can't pee. <laughs> if 
feel better? Yes. Do you need to go pee? <laughs> All right. So you went to Kai, uh, in Chikai, um, but he didn't die until later. Um, Japanese Prime Minister Okuma Shingen Nobu was the one who issued the 21 demands. And here are the 21 demands. The 21 demands, um, they, they were rejected by the Chinese. Here. So, okay, sorry, the 21 demands, when the, you give to the tw when they gave the Chinese the 21 demands, if the Chinese agreed to it, it's essentially saying, take over our whole country. We'll be looking at the 21 demands uh, later on in this class. Uh, it's, it'll be part of, well, it'll actually be part of your homework. Yep. Japan gave it to China. Yes, Japan gave China the 21 demands. And so, uh, and if the Chinese agreed, it will essentially became, uh, become, um, you know, a Japanese colony. And so China read the thing, read the 21 demands, and they gave it back to Japan and said, you know what, uh, can we just change the last part of it, please? <laughs> part, uh, uh, section 5, uh, group 5 of the demands, because the demands here are five, five sec sections, right? And so China read it and said, uh, we can't accept part 5. Can you? We'll accept, the part, we'll accept one to four, we can't accept five. And so Japan uh, took it back and said, okay, fine, just, just take one, uh, one to four is fine. Similar to ultimatum. It was basically an ultimatum, yeah. If, if you don't agree to it, we're going to attack you. <laughs> right? And, you, and Yuan Shikai, the president of China at that time, had to agree because he, he, he knew he couldn't fight the Japanese. But an interesting thing is, the 21 demands, Group 5 was the most important group of the documents. Group 5 would have given Japan control over China. However, you take out Group 5, the first four, section, first four groups actually gave Japan everything that Japan already had over in China. For example, a Japanese could go and live in China, Japanese could work in China, Japan could buy, buy houses in China, they could rent land, they could buy land in China. I mean, Japan already had those things, so essentially, the 21 demands turned into the 13 demands which really did not benefit the Japanese. On the other hand, it had negative consequences for uh, the Japanese, in which the Japanese, uh, their intentions in China became apparent to the West. America realized that Japan wanted stuff in China. And so, um, and, it, and it drew a lot of protests from America. And that's really one of the first instances, not the first, but one of the first major instances of Japan in America, butting heads, right? And J Japan and America later on, they fight in World War II. This is one of the early instances of tensions increasing. So remember we did the U dive at the beginning of the year. Uh, escalation of tensions is definitely one of the major things. Now why would, why would America be so interested in China? Oh, they're trading. Okay, oh, number one, trading. Yet yeah, they're right across from each other. What else? In the Philippines, they had Philippines. Yeah, okay. America had Philippines, so it's pretty close to China. What else? Resources. Uh, resources. Yes, they were they're trading, but not so much resources. They, I mean, they could get some resources in China, but America wasn't too concerned about resources at that time. They, they were... Ah, Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine. No, Monroe Doctrine is saying America for Americans. No, uh, like America for the, Americans. Oh. No, so not the Monroe Doctrine. They can use the Chinese mm -hmm. No, not quite. That's the blocking the communist comes later in uh, World War. Um, Fear of no, not the open door policy. They actually had it. Actually, America um, bef before that time had the uh, had the Chinese Exclusion Act. <laughs> so they didn't want any more Chinese to come over to America. America had a lot of missionaries in China, and I'm not saying the missionaries determine everything. But at that time, missionaries are a very strong connection back to the home country, right? You guys, any any uh, any of you guys go to church? Okay. Oh, when you go to church, have you ever had missionaries come and speak? Yeah. Yeah. Mother Teresa. And not Mother, okay, Mother Teresa is is a missionary, uh, but um, no, not Mother Teresa. <laughs> not that not that time. Um, missionaries would go to countries and they'll live there with the people and so on. And if a major major, you know, something unfair happens or there's an attack or whatever, the missionaries would write letters home and say, you know, there's a problem here, pray for us. Right? You guys have heard of that a lot of times, pray for us, right? And so, a lot of missionaries were in China because China was, you know, there's a lot of people there and there's, there were actually a lot of Chinese in, in America at that time. And so, 
America and China has built a pretty close relationship during that uh, during that time, particularly with the with the Christian presence in China. And so when Japan started encroaching upon China, America was very much aware of it, and they were very sensitive to Chinese sentiments. And you'll notice that through uh, until the beginning of the Cold War, America has always backed China. So in the case of the, third, uh, the negative consequences for Japan for the uh, 21 demands or was that uh, America, Amer uh, uh, Japanese and American relations turned sour. By 1917, America joined World War I. And, um, and, they, and um, America and Japan made something called the Lansing, the Lansing Ishii Agreement, where America recognized the gains made up to 1917 and was promised by Japan that they will no longer expand. I'll say this one more time. The Lansing Ishii agree Agreement was where America recognized the gains made up to 1917 by Japan and was promised by Japan that they, were no lo that they would no longer expand. 1917. So Japan and America agreed that Japan promised America we would no longer expand, and that, but and America promised that we'd recognize all the territorial gains up to that point. So basically, mean, meant that Korea was recognized, um, parts of Shandong were, were recognized once because Japan took over, um, uh, beat, they, they fought the Germans in Shandong, which is Qingdao today. If you went to MU, none of you guys went to MU in here, uh, but uh, which is Qingdao today. Uh, parts of the chain. Yeah. Didn't U.S. let Japan took over Korea because Japan gave Philippines to? Uh, no. No, Japan. Japan's Japan's interests at that time were mainly in Korea and China. It hasn't expanded south. It hasn't expanded south to the islands yet. What was Chinese Exclusion Act? Or something? China, the Chinese Exclusion Act was in the nineteenth century. Nineteenth century in America. Don't worry about that. This agreement was ratified, it was basically it was confirmed in the, the Treaty of Versailles. And that's, that, led, that, that then led to something called the May 4th Movement in China. We'll talk about that later on. Um, the China, and China at that time felt, as a result of the Lansing Yishi Agreement, they felt betrayed by the U.S., uh, which, had, uh, who, which, which was uh, you know, very sympathetic to China up to that point. But China also felt betrayed by the U.S. at that time, and you know some say that opened the door. Some say this event possibly opened some opened the door to some communism in in uh, the Chinese minds because they're like, okay, can't rely on the Americans too much. Let's turn to the Russians, right? And so uh, the next thing that next major thing that happens is Japan. Uh, in the Russian Civil War, but we're going to end it here right now. Um, that's all for today. Why did, why did China feel? Why did China? Oh, why did China feel betrayed by America? Yeah, J U.S. The Twenty One Demands drew negative sentiments from um, America, and uh, and so but, and. It drew negative uh, sentiments from America, and therefore Japanese and American relations, the Japanese and American relations turned sour. Right? It was it. Uh, however, at the same time, America, because it joined World War One, and Japan was also on the side of the, the Entente in World War One, therefore they were allies, mm -hmm. and that's why and, Jap and America could not. America and Japan can't be arguing. You know, or shouldn't be arguing while well, they're allies. So they made an agreement and say, okay, let's let's focus on fighting. And so at that time, China felt betrayed. But what's interesting was China was also part of the ally side of World War One. And so here you have a situation where everyone they're all they all suddenly become allies, but at the same time, China did not like it. I mean, it, it wasn't they didn't they felt it was a betrayal of sorts. Okay. That's all for today. We're going to look at the 21 demands now, the, the primary document.